So now uh, we will start. And the first thing that I must ask you, do you have the earphone? Because some people will speak in French. If you don't have, uh, uh, there is translation between French and uh, English. I hope that you have your uh, earphone. If not, maybe you can ask one and uh, we can give it to you. Uh, and we will start with the first session, the legal framework relevant to cooperate, to cooperate conduct. And uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four intervention of expert. I will thank at this occasion all the experts having do all the preparation of this session, all the work that they have done, and uh, also to the witnesses to be here today and to help us to go to the conclusion of this uh, international session of the Russell Terminal on Palestine. I will ask to uh, Osin Wasra to come to the floor and to give his contribution. He will speak in French. Si la question de la complicité euh, des entreprises multinationales dans la violation des droits internationaux, du droit de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire est soulevée par différents ordres juridiques et internationaux, tels que nous aurons l'occasion de le voir dans quelques instants, le droit international n'est pas en reste sur cette question. La nécessité d'encadrer juridiquement les agissements des, act des, des entreprises multinationales et partant leur éventuelle complicité dans les violations du droit international, des droits de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire, a fait débat ces dernières années aux Nations Unies. C'est ainsi qu'en 1999, à l'initiative du secrétaire général des Nations Unies, voilà, je disais donc que la question de la complicité des entreprises multinationales avait fait débat ces dernières années au sein des Nations Unies. Et c'est ce qui avait amené le, à l'initiative du secrétaire général, les Nations Unies, à adopter un pacte mondial qui s'adressait directement aux entreprises et où la, la question de la complicité y était abordée de manière directe. En effet, ce pacte stipule, et je le cite, « Les entreprises sont invitées à veiller à ce que leurs propres compagnies ne se rendent pas complices des violations des droits de l'homme. » Alors, si ce texte n'est pas contraignant, il permet néanmoins d'établir une typologie claire des différents types de complicité. Et à ce titre, je vais encore vous le citer, il prévoit que il y a complicité directe quand une entreprise aide sciemment un État à violer les droits de l'homme. Il y a complicité avec profit quand une entreprise tire directement avantage des violations des droits de l'homme commises par autrui, Enfin, il y a complicité silencieuse selon les défenseurs des droits de l'homme quand une entreprise s'abstient de soulever la question des violations systématiques ou persistantes des droits de l'homme dans ses relations avec les autorités politiques. À, ce, à, à, à cet égard, le tribunal Russell sur la Palestine aura par exemple à statuer sur le cas d'entreprises à l'instar de Caterpillar qui fournissent euh, des bulldozers destinés à la destruction des maisons dans les territoires palestiniens, sachant que les destructions de maisons sont formellement interdites par la quatrième convention de Genève. Et là, je vous cite aussi l'article qui les interdit pour donner corps à mon propos. Il est interdit à la puissance... Parce que... Je baisse un peu les micros, voilà. Il est interdit à la puissance occupante de détruire des biens immobiliers ou immobiliers appartenant individuellement ou collectivement à des personnes privées, à l'État ou à des collectivités publiques, à des organisations sociales ou coopératives, sauf dans les cas où ces destructions seraient rendues absolument nécessaires par les opérations militaires. Un pas, sera, un pas important sera franchi au sein des Nations Unies en 2003, avec l'adoption d'un texte sur les normes portant sur le respect des droits de l'homme par les entreprises multinationales. Et là, la notion de complicité y est précisé davantage et l'obligation d'éviter de se rendre complice de violations des droits de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire y est précisée dans les termes suivants. 
Non, c'est les creux, ils ne sont pas pratiques. Les sociétés transnationales et autres entreprises ne participent pas à des crimes de guerre, crimes contre l'humanité, génocide, actes de torture, disparition forcée, pratiques de travail forcé ou obligatoire, prise d'otages, exécution extrajudiciaire, sommaire ou arbitraire, autres violations du droit international humanitaire et autres crimes internationaux contre la personne telle que définie par le droit international. Ici aussi, le tribunal Russell aura à statuer sur des cas, et notamment le cas de la société Violia, directement impliquée dans la construction d'une ligne de tramway reliant euh, Jérusalem aux colonies de peuplement dans les territoires palestiniens, sachant aussi ici que cette pratique est interdite par la quatrième convention de Genève. Et là aussi, je vous cite l'article. La puissance occupante ne pourra pas procéder à la déportation ou au transfert d'une partie de sa propre population civile dans un territoire occupé par elle. Alors, la, la volonté d'approfondir la notion de complicité euh, amènera le secrétaire général des Nations Unies en 2005 à nommer un représentant spécial chargé de la question des entreprises multinationales et du respect international des droits de l'homme en la personne de John Ruggie, professeur à l'université d'Advard. Il soumettra un rapport très important en 2008 qui renvoie euh, à la notion de diligence raisonnable. La notion de diligence raisonnable oblige toute entreprise à évaluer les risques potentiels de participation à des violations des droits de l'homme dans leur activité quotidienne et le cas échéant à y mettre fin. Là aussi, le tribunal euh, recèle sur la Palestine aura statué sur des cas tels que le cas de la banque Dexia et d'analyser si par exemple le groupe bancaire belge ne méconnaît pas son obligation de diligence raisonnable en participant à l'effort de colonisation des territoires palestiniens. Alors, fonder la responsabilité des entreprises en droit international n'est pas toujours évident. Néanmoins, le rapporteur spécial des Nations Unies préconise de procéder à un raisonnement par analogie avec les principes du droit international pénal international et il, pour ce faire, il s'appuie sur la jurisprudence. Merci Pierre. Je disais donc que fonder la responsabilité des entreprises en droit international n'est pas chose évidente. Et pour ce faire, le rapporteur spécial des Nations Unies préconise de procéder à un raisonnement par analogie avec les principes du droit, international, euh, les principes du droit pénal international. Pour ce faire, il s'appuie sur la jurisprudence des tribunaux pénaux internationaux pour l'ex-Yougoslavie et le Rwanda, et notamment aussi sur la jurisprudence de la Cour pénale internationale. Bien que ces, euh, ces, ces trois institutions judiciaires euh, ne concernent dans leurs compétences que les personnes physiques, l'analyse de leur jurisprudence permet d'aller au-delà de ces considérations et d'établir obligation, une obligation internationale de ne pas prêter assistance aux violations des droits de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire. Je vous remercie. Merci à euh, Et je passe maintenant la parole à Richard Hermer. Richard Hermer. Yes, welcome. You have the floor. Richard Hammer is from the UK. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, members of the uh, tribunal, my name is uh, Richard Hermer. I'm a lawyer practicing in London. I was called to the bar in 1993 and appointed Queen's Counsel in 2009. The uh, <clears throat> area in which I practice is human rights and it falls into mainly two areas. Firstly, uh, it is uh, seeking redress for victims of government violations of human rights. So, for example, uh, I've represented people who've been tortured by the British Army in Iraq, or more recently, um, those um, who uh, were held, British citizens held in Guantanamo Bay. The other part of my practice, though, concerns representations for victims of human rights violations at the hands of multinational corporations, either directly 
or indirectly, and that's a field of academic interest to me, having been formerly the human rights practitioner in residence at Columbia University in New York. But it's an area in which I've worked, and I hope to be able to give um, some assistance to the tribunal <coughs> in trying to come to terms with what the framework is for understanding where and when, excuse me, <coughs> the law can provide mechanisms for accountability and redress. And I'm going to talk particularly about English law, because it's the only area of law I know anything uh, about. But it does need to be seen in the context with the... Uh, uh, um, that'd be perfect, thank you very much. With the evidence that you're also going to hear um, from my colleagues from France and America, because there's a big picture here. And that big picture stems from this. It is a frustration that was felt by many in the human rights field as to the inadequacy of the systems for redress for victims of human rights violations. Since the Second World War, law has been very good at putting in place mechanisms for dealing with violations of human rights abuses by states. We have the, the great conventions, the great international conventions, protecting the rights of individuals, but that's all about states. And it's all about states' action against states, and it's all about individual react, individuals' interaction with states. From the human rights context, the world is a more complicated place. Because whilst it is undoubtedly true that states continue to infringe human rights violations, uh, and indeed that is why uh, we are here. The way that multinational corporations have been shown to operate demonstrates firstly that they too uh, have been complicit in, in human rights abuses, and it secondly identifies the absence of mechanisms for securing what I think are the two most important things for human rights victims, Firstly, is redress for the victim, and secondly, is accountability, so that those who are responsible for the violations of their human rights are held accountable. And when law is working at its highest and its most noblest, it does secure redress for the victims and accountability for those who have caused them harm. Now, <clears throat> standing here in Chancery Lane, which is the, the heart of uh, the English legal system, one would have thought that in a system that uh, abides, say, or seeks to abide by the rule of law, that finding answers to these problems as to how do we seek redress and accountability for acts of multinationals would be a relatively straightforward question with a relatively straightforward answer, but it's not. What hundreds of years of English legal history have given us is a very clear system, for example, how companies operate amongst each other. It gives us a very clear system of criminal law. It gives a very clear system of what my redress is if I have a car accident um, on the street. But what English law has never grappled with before, and until recently, in many ways, North American, US law, is what do I do if I'm a victim of a human rights abuse in which a multinational corporation had been responsible? And English law is a law based on precedent. It's a common law system. And it doesn't have any bespoke laws that deal precisely with this um, problem and with these issues. And so what does English, or speaking for myself, Welsh lawyers um, have had to uh, do is try and use the existing legal framework that is in place, which has never addressed itself to this particular scenario, and ask ourselves, what can we take from this? How can we use this to try and find some solutions to assist victims of human rights? Now, the general answer that I'm going to give is that there is potential within our common law system to provide redress, but it is not easy. There are certain circumstances in which it will be possible, and others which may not be possible now, but may be possible in the future. 
And the reason I caveat that is because English law does not move quickly. It adopts an incremental approach to its own development. And whilst the cases that I and others have been involved in have been helping push the boundaries a little bit more, a little bit more, English law is not geared up to revolutionary steps. So that's the context in, in, in which I hope my evidence can be of assistance. Can I just touch on four areas that may be of assistance to the tribunal? The first is in the realm of what English lawyers call public law. Now, that isn't directly against multinationals. It's against the state. It allows individuals to go before the court and seek what is called judicial review of government decisions. And by government, I don't just mean Downing Street or, or Parliament. I mean all layers of government in the country down to local government. And it allows you to challenge them. And some challenges have been brought which are direct challenges to the British government's uh, policy in respect of arms sales to Israel, and also the British government's uh, foreign policy, not least arising out of the judgment uh, of the uh, International um, Court of Justice, the World Court, in respect of its opinion of the war. Uh, and a challenge was brought saying, that in light of that, in light of what the court had said there about the obligations of all governments to take steps, and not to anything that uh, condones um, Israeli's actions in that regard. A challenge was brought uh, uh, by a Palestinian human rights NGO to try and force the government into taking strong action against the Israelis. Um, that failed because what the English court said, what the administrative court said, is that it's no role of ours to be trampling up in, in foreign affairs. And so that's an example of where a very direct challenge was made in a public law context, and it failed. But where I think there is room for optimism in the future are in um, less blunt, less direct challenges. Can I give you uh, uh, an example? Uh, many public authorities contract services from private companies. We, we live in this country in the age of privatization, um, developed with, uh, e with relish by our, our former Labour uh, government. Many of those local authorities, the public authorities, all of whom are amenable to challenge by way of judicial review, uh, many of them will set out um, the principles upon which they will contract out. So, for example, they will talk about their commitment to human rights. And it strikes me that where a uh, local authority or any other public authority contracts with uh, companies who have a proven track record of not conforming with human rights or being complicit in breaches of human rights, then potential challenges lie against the public authority for contracting with such companies because they will be acting contrary to their own stated policy, which is a ground of judicial review. So that, that's public law. Can I talk about private law, which is the law that governs the relationship between um, private um, bodies? And it is here um, that there is most fruit, potentially, for actions against companies, because it's through private law that you can bring actions um, against companies. And this is an area in which we were inspired, I say we, I, I mean generally English lawyers working in this field, we were inspired by developments in the United States that I think you're going to hear from um, a speaker from um, shortly, where they used statute, dusted down a 200-year-old statute to bring cases uh, against perpetrators, companies, uh, although I think you're going to hear that things are taking a rather unfortunate turn in America in, in, in respect of the future for those cases. But here, we were, have been inspired um, by that and have tried to use tort law to develop these type of cases. Now, the type of cases that have gone on thus far are, uh, um, to, to give you some examples, um, there's a case that is proceeding before the High Court uh, in, at the moment against an English mining company whose subsidiary are involved in being complicit in the torture of Peruvian miners who were protesting, having an environmental protest in Peru. Another well-known example is, is a case brought against a company called Trafigura, 
that uh, William, your next speaker, was also uh, involved in, I I in which um, 30,000 inhabitants of the Ivory Coast brought proceedings 40 yards away in the court for damages caused when environmental toxic waste um, had been dumped in Abidjan in the, coast of, in, the, in the Ivory Coast. So those are the kind of cases that are developing now, many of them brought by one of your um, expert um, uh, assistance firm. Tort law is, though, a delicate tool. And it has been used thus far in very clear-cut situations. What, uh, uh, um, that what one needs to start with for a tort claim is a victim. You can't bring claims in, as you can in America and other jurisdictions in, in isolation on behalf of a notional victim. You need a victim. And you need to show that that victim has suffered harm as a direct consequence of the acts or the omissions of the multinational or whoever your defendant is. But their injuries or their losses, be they financial or be they injury to their bodies, are as a direct result, have been caused or contributed to by the acts or omissions of another. And uh, that is where one of the areas of difficulty in cases uh, of complicity, particularly looking in the context of Israel-Palestine, is going to be. To take um, Michael Mansfield's example, their cases might be straightforward. Because if you sell in this country a, 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 um, an enormous digger to the Israelis, knowing that um, Israelis use those for demolition of houses, collective punishment in violation of international law. A a and there is a foreseeable risk that when you're selling that, that's what it's going to be used for. Then I would have thought, subject to 425 different complexities that English law throws up, but I would have thought that there is there an arguable case that if you are in a house that is demolished by that digger, you have a cause of action against the person who supplied it, knowing it might be used for that purpose. Where it becomes much more complicated, and I hope I've raised this in the written paper that I provided to the tribunal, is where a company is one or two or three steps removed from it, where that company is part of a larger, a larger group of countries, uh, companies that's providing uh, uh, um, those resources um, to the um, Israelis and the Israeli state. So at this stage, in what is early stages for this type of, of this type of litigation, human rights litigation in the United Kingdom, the type of cases that are going to proceed are where you can show a direct relationship between the act and the injury, and where you can show that the provision of that service was going to foreseeably lead to the injury to your victim. I've touched upon two other areas, which I won't talk about uh, now, but I've touched them on in my paper, which are areas for improvement in the future. One of them is in respect of the recommendations that are going to come from Professor Ruggie of Harvard, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Business and Human Rights, and his recommendations for improvement of an international system allowing redress and accountability for victims of acts of multinational corporations. And the second, the, sorry, the final point that I've raised again in paper are the informal mechanism provided by the OECD and the certainly in this country provides a mechanism, albeit one that is not binding, but for any individuals to make complaints to the United Kingdom government in respect of acts and omissions of multinationals overseas. And um, although that does not give you a day in court, um, it provides and hopefully provides a mechanism for holding account companies accountable. I hope that evidence is of assistance to the tribunal. Uh, I'm not standing up for this. Uh, myself and Cynthia are chairing this particular session. Uh, other jurors will do other sessions. It's just to keep a handle on what's going on. And obviously any juror may have questions to ask. So that, that's the way we're going forward. Um, Richard, may I just kick it off in a way it, it, from what I said in opening that to, to try and take concrete examples uh, rather than the, the, the principles, how the principles might apply 
Uh, and there are really two issues I want to take up with you. One relates to the objection that is taken in America as well as here about dabbling in foreign policy yep. by the courts. That's one. Uh, but I'm going to start with the, the private law situation of, of a company um, like Caterpillar, but I'm going to use one that I, I, I hope you're aware of and others will be aware of. This is a company called Elbit. Now, Elbit is one of the largest uh, weapons manufacturers, and it manufactures not only weapons but s electronic systems. It has been complicit in the building of the wall, complicit in the building of surveillance materials, complicit in the building of drones, sometimes called Hermes drones. Now, let's take a very, con again, concrete example. If you're living in the occupied territories and you have been injured by a drone that has been manufactured, and this company has manufacturing bases within the United Kingdom, one of which I understand is at Litchfield. Now, would a Palestinian have recourse to the English courts in tort to do something about a situation in which injury has been caused by their, a, a drone manufactured by that company? Yeah. Uh, the answer is they would have access to the court. If, we, if it could be demonstrated that Elbit were domiciled within this jurisdiction, within England or Wales, then as of right, you can bring a claim for them. So let's say we have a victim, a Palestinian victim, um, of that drone attack. They would bring a claim for their injuries, or if they, if they were killed, their estate would bring a claim for their injuries, and the English court would entertain it because jurisdiction had been established. What one would then have to go on to show is firstly that... Um, that their, their, their losses were caused by that drone that was manufactured by a company domiciled here. So actually forensically, not always very easy. Um, they would also have to show that um, it, the Elbit was acting unlawfully essentially in providing that drone to the Israeli government. Now there, it would become, it'd become a question of foreseeability. Was it foreseeable, not that they would provide it, it would be used, but was it foreseeable that they would provide it and it would be used in an unlawful way? Because the courts here will not say that every use of every weapon is unlawful. But if you're going to use it in an unlawful way, so for example, uh, in an unlawful military um, incursion, uh, or to um, attack a civilian population in a way that is contrary to international law, um, then it would be um, certainly arguable. What? I just give this as an example to reflect the complexities often of these cases because there, no there are no simple answers. What would be said by um, Elbit is that they um, provided um, this, uh, th these arms um, in accordance with an export license approved by the government. And they would rely upon case law saying that when you, which, which wasn't developed in the field of arms, um, but when you provide something in accordance with your own home state's regulations, then you can't be in breach of a duty of care. Now, that's case law developed on different facts. I'm not convinced it would be applicable here. There would be, certainly be an argument about it here. But the short answer to your question is yes. That's the type of case that could be developed. And the caveat is with a whole host of layers of complexity. But nevertheless, that is the type of case. And it, it, it's quite a good example of a case because... There are many cases which are so compelling on their facts where what has happened to the victim is just so awful, but they just don't actually uh, um, result in good legal cases. And the difficulty for human rights lawyers, as you all know, uh, uh, as well as anybody, is that when you're trying to develop the law, you want to do it on the best facts possible because bad facts create bad law for human rights lawyers. A, a subsidiary to that really is asking you, use the word domicile, I mean, uh, what would make Elbit domiciled in the United Kingdom in order to make them eligible? If they had their registered office here, for example. Right. But if they didn't have a registered office? Well, if, if the factory that was producing the, drone, uh, the drones or the missiles um, was a factory here, that's sufficient. Right. Second uh, point, which I started with, and then I'll hand over to others, and that is this question of government policy, namely that courts here 
and elsewhere, as it happens, will not interfere with issues that could be said to relate to foreign policy. Now, is there any prospect, as it seems to me just as a matter of logic and common sense, that actually uh, this is confusing policy issues about who you're going to help as opposed to dealing with uh, clear human rights violations? Yeah. I, the, the, it, there's a much better uh, position here than in the States. In the States, a whole host of um, important human rights cases have been closed down simply because they touch upon issues of foreign relations. To give you an example, Binyam Mohamed, one of the Guantanamo okay. detainees, has been bringing an action in California uh, against Jefferson, who were a company who um, arranged the rendition flights. And um, that has been closed down by the appeal court, the Ninth Circuit in the States because it, they, they received a, a, a witness statement from a general, Hayden, telling them that um, this is just far too sensitive. End of story. In this country, the courts are much more robust, not in the field of public law. There, the courts have been very careful to say you can't bring challenges that tell the government what they can and cannot do on foreign relations. But in the realm of private law, when you want to bring a case against a company, there the courts are very robust. You know, that, that they might be called upon to um, make findings about other countries' international law positions doesn't really bother the courts here. And they do it every day, for example, in immigration perspective, when you're trying to stop someone being um, returned to a country with a bad human rights record. Courts here are happy to do it. And I don't think that would present a major problem for these type of cases. Right, yeah. anyone else? Uh, yes, John. I think it's on. Oh, uh, yes, I, I would like to ask a question about the uh, principle of uh, forum non-convenience. Mm. Uh, there's a, a recent decision in Canada uh, involving a Canadian company which uh, did business with one of the settlements uh, in Israel. An attempt was made to bring a case in Canada uh, against this particular Canadian company, and the Canadian court held that it was more convenient for the case to be heard in uh, Israel yes. rather than in Canada, despite the fact that the Israeli courts have refused, consistently refused to uh, pronounce upon the legality of the settlement endeavor. I see in your paper that you say that uh, this is no longer a problem in the United Kingdom. Yeah. Is that absolutely clear? Can I, can I explain that how we've got to this, to this point? Forum non-convenience, so that's the argument that defendants would always, would always deploy to say you can't bring your case in England when it's to do what's going on in the DRC or Israel-Palestine, wherever, uh, um, because it's much more convenient. The acts and omissions took place in that other country, not in England, so you should deal with them there. So the principle of forum non-convenience was always an argument we faced and a very big argument. It has mainly gone for two reasons. Firstly, because a case was brought, um, again by Lee Day, who I mentioned bring the cases uh, of, of this nature in this country, on behalf of a large group of Southern African miners uh, who had all contracted asbestos. Uh, and they brought it against the headquarters company in the UK. And the forum non-convenience argument was taken and run all the way along by the defendants who were saying, you, just, this is, you, should, you have to have this in South Africa. You can't have it in London. What the House of Lords, our highest court, as that was then our highest court held, was that even though South Africa was the most convenient forum, because the claimants could not get justice in that country, because it was still in the early post-apartheid days, there was no system for dealing with thousands of claims, class actions, because legal aid wasn't available. So because justice couldn't be done there, jurisdiction could be established in London. So that was a major step forward. But what actually um, has really made this issue beyond argument in many cases uh, is the decision of the European Court of Justice looking at the regulations that um, bind European countries. A and in a decision in a case actually nothing to do with human rights about travel package rules for holidays in Jamaica, um, they held that once a defendant is domiciled in a member state, then you can establish jurisdiction against it as of right, irrespective as to where the wrong was committed. So, for example, in the Trafigura case, 
There was no argument about jurisdiction when there would have been an enormous argument years before that. In the Peru case I mentioned, no argument um, about jurisdiction because even though the acts and omissions occurred in a mine in a very remote part of Peru, the headquarter company, which is the one that um, is being sued, are registered in London. So that has actually enormously assisted in this type of human rights litigation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to draw, as you will see, there is a, a schedule which we're trying to keep to. We're running a little behind already. So unless there's any burning question from anyone else, can I Could thank Richard very much indeed for his help? Yeah. Uh, we're much obliged for you. Can I apologise to the tribunal? I'm afraid that um, I'm not going to be around for the, the, the rest of the weekend. My uh, four-year-old and my six-year-old have exercised their human rights to family life, and I'm afraid they're... Uh, <laughs> they're taking... thank you. All right. And can I also say that the papers or reports that each expert has um, made before we sat is available so that in fact all the other things that he could have said orally is in written form so you'll be able to see that later. Um, may we have the next expert please which is Yasmin Gardu. Yes, there you are. My name is Yasmin Gatto, and I'm a lawyer based in Los Angeles. Um, for most of my career, I actually worked primarily on the defense, corporate defense side. Um, and through my involvement in Palestine, um, I wrote a study on the issue of corporate complicity and human rights abuses in Palestine. So that's why I'm, I'm here today. Um, and corporate complicity in human rights abuses is a broad topic under US law. Um, so I will uh, focus on two U.S. laws that can be used and are being used to sue a multinational corporation in the U.S. federal court for human rights violations that occurred overseas. And I'll also list a few of the defenses that corporations have used to defeat these claims to give an understanding of um, the limitations of those laws. Um, the, f the most important law that allows a victim to sue a multinational corporation for human rights abuses occurring outside the U.S. is the Alien Tort Claims Act. This law provides U.S. courts with jurisdiction over claims by non-U.S. nationals against U.S. or non-U.S. nationals for violations of the Law of Nations or a U.S. treaty. The Law of, Nat law of Nations is what we refer to today as customary international law. The defendant being sued must be present in the U.S. when the claim is filed, but this is the only connection to the U.S. that's needed under the law itself. Although um, in prudential doctrines, um, judges have actually um, tried to limit that somewhat. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, with respect to certain international legal norms, such as war crimes and crimes against humanity, the plaintiffs can sue the corporation for directly committing the human rights violations. Regarding other norms like torture, extrajudicial killing, which is basically killing without any judicial process preceding it, um, and certain other violations, the plaintiff may sue a corporation for aiding and abetting the violations by a foreign government. So in the context of Palestine, the Alien Tort Claims Act provides U.S. courts with the authority to hear claims by Palestinians or other foreign nationals against U.S. or foreign multinational corporations involved in human rights abuses in Palestine if the corporation is present in the U.S. by being incorporated there or by doing continuous business there. Uh, there are limitations, like I mentioned, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, I want to just stress that the Alien Tort Claims Act is very unique. Uh, to my knowledge, no other jurisdiction has anything like it at the moment, um, although Europe is catching up. Um, but currently, it stands alone in establishing near universal civil jurisdiction. And the law has made U.S. courts uh, the primary forum today for human rights litigation against corporations. Um, dozens of claims have been filed under the law against corporations for complicity in human rights abuses committed outside the U.S. And as these cases are working their way through the U.S. courts, certain issues have been raised and resolved differently by different appellate courts. 
Um, one of these issues is whether a corporation can be sued under the Alien Tort Statute at all. Um, in September, the Court of Appeals for the New York Region, which is an influential court on issues of corporate law, held that the statute could not be used to sue corporations, only individuals. Um, so therefore, corporate officials or employees may be sued, but the corporation, which profited from the violations, can't be sued. Um, I think a petition to have the case reheard has been filed, um, but if it stands, and um, I'm sure it will be appealed to the Supreme Court, but currently um, you cannot sue a corporation um, under the Alien Tort Claims Act in that jurisdiction in the New York area. Um, another issue on where there's disagreement um, is the proper standard for aiding and abetting, i.e. what types of actions and what mental state must a corporation have to be deemed to have aided and abetted the human rights abuses of a third party. Some courts have held that knowingly providing substantial assistance to the third party is sufficient. Others require a higher standard that a corporation must intend to commit the abuses. So under this higher standard, if a corporation provides assistance to the perpetrator merely to profit, the corporation can't be said to have aided and abetted the abuses, the human rights abuses. Um, so this is a very high standard um, that is difficult for plaintiffs to meet. The second relevant law here is the Torture Victim Protection Act. This law provides U.S. or non-U.S. nationals the right to sue the perpetrator of torture or extrajudicial killings committed anywhere in the world for damages if the perpetrator was acting with actual or apparent authority of a foreign nation. Aiders and abettors of the foreign governments of the perpetrator's abuses can all also be sued. Um, the Torture Victim Protection Act differs from the Alien Tort Claims Act in two important ways. Um, first, it's narrower in scope since only torture and extrajudicial killings can be the basis of a claim. And secondly, the plaintiffs first have to pursue any adequate remedies available in the state where the violation took place before bringing a claim in a U.S. court. So, for example, in a case against a U.S. or non-U.S. multinational corporation allegedly committing or aiding and abetting human rights abuses in Palestine, the plaintiff would first have to pursue any adequate remedies available under Israeli law before bringing a claim in the U.S. What, uh, what's considered adequate is a judgment called by, by the court, and, you know, I think the the history of bias in Israeli courts um, in past claims by Palestinians, you know, arguably, you know, um, would render those remedies inadequate, could be, could be deemed inadequate. Um, an important note on the Torture Victim Protection Act, there's disagreement among U.S. courts as to whether a corporation can be sued under the, under the act or only corporate officials. Um, some courts do allow a claim against the corporate, the corporate entity itself um, as well as to corporate officials. Other, others limit it to corporate officials only. Um, the case of Corey versus Caterpillar is obviously a very important case. In 2005, I, I think someone's already described it, but um, the Center for Constitutional Rights um, brought a case against Caterpillar under the Alien Tort Statute and the Torture Victim Protection Act on behalf of the family of Rachel Corey and four Palestinian families living in the West Bank and Gaza. The plaintiffs argued that Caterpillar aided and abetted war crimes and other serious human rights violations by selling bulldozers to the Israeli military, which it knew would be used for illegal de demolitions of Palestinian homes. Uh, those weren't the only claims brought, um, but I don't think I'll go into more detail on that because Maria LaHood of the Center for Constitutional Rights will be discussing the case tomorrow. She was a lawyer for the plaintiffs in that case. Uh, but two minutes? Oh my gosh. Uh, wow. I'm going to skip to defenses because I, I really want to explain the limitations somewhat. Um, there's a real problem with suing multinational corporations in terms of personal jurisdiction. Um, 
a corporation has to be present in the U.S. Yeah. to be sued there. Uh, but the problem, uh, if the problem is that um, corporations <clears throat> often they have a parent, you know, in one jurisdiction, and then they ha have a subsidiary that's actually doing the harmful acts in another jurisdiction. And the parent, the actions of the subsidiary can't normally be attributed to the parent, uh, except for narrow, two narrow exceptions, um, which have been applied actually in um, at least one case under the Alien Tort Claims Act case against Shell. I really can't go into more detail than that. I apologize. Um, the second defense is forum nonconvenience. We touched on that before. Um, I, I just want to mention actually that uh, recently a court of appeals addressed the fact that the forum nonconvenience is kind of intention in tension with the Alien Tort Claims Act because the Alien Tort Claims Act, the whole purpose is to allow a foreign national to sue in a U.S. court relating to events that occurred outside the U.S. So in that situation, the court didn't dismiss the case on that ground. Um, political question doctrine, I, I think I should just mention that. Um, this has been an obstacle in, ca in cases against Israeli defendants um, in general and essentially U.S. judges, they have discretion to dismiss a case that involves an uh, issue that falls within the authority of the political branches of government, Congress and the executive branch. And the Caterpillar case was dismissed on this ground um, because uh, the U.S. paid for the Caterpillar bulldozers, um, deciding the case would question foreign policy. That was the holding um, in that case. Um, I won't go into go into the other defenses. Um, I, j I guess I, I would just want to say that um, in general I think it's good to remind ourselves that corporations are created by states and governments are account and state governments are accountable to people or at least they should be. Um, so therefore governments have to regulate corporations to ensure they behave in a way that furthers the public interest and when they fail this duty people have an obligation to speak out and I think this tribunal is a tremendous example of that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasmine. I think because of the pressures of time, if you wouldn't mind going back, we'll have the second speaker and then we'll have questions. Okay. Sure. So we will take questions, it's just we'll have the next speaker now. Um, so if you wouldn't mind, please, the next witness, William Borden, please. So, Mr. President, Honorable Judge, I'm a French lawyer practicing in Paris since uh, 30 years. <laughs> I'm also the president fundator of an NGO called Sherpa, dedicated to uh, finding a judicial solution faced to damage caused by means transnational in southern countries. So I ask for the indulgence of the tribunal. I've decided to abandon my mother language and I've chosen to speak in English, hoping it will be more dynamic, even, in, even if I could not avoid perhaps sometimes a few mistakes. I want uh, first to tell you that I've been involved to try to prosecute companies since many years I've lodged a criminal complaint against Total on behalf of forced labor working in Yadana uh, in Burma, and I've been at the origin of an unprecedented settlement with Total in 1995. More recently, uh, I've been at the origin of a complaint in 1997, in, two, in two, 2007, in Paris against three uh, African head of state, Sassoon Gesso, Bongo, Obiang, their family, their French complice, and I'm quite proud to have obtained an uh, unprecedented decision of criminal court a couple of, couple of days ago, which permit the opening of investigation, criminal investigation, against this head of state, their family, and their complice, including French companies. I want to share with your tribunal uh, first uh, uh, two or three 
uh, observation. One, uh, globalization, financialization of the economy have granted unprecedented power to transnational. And this unprecedented power uh, makes possible that the dispute, the challenge, the sovereignty of the state. Second observation, since the 90s, international transnational companies have multiplied, have sophisticated a strong message to try to convince the world that they were deeply, deeply committed in favor of human rights and sustainable development. So for, for the first time in the world, transnational companies want to convince us that they are now new benefactor of humanity. Third observation, the violation of international law in West Bank, in occupied territory, is since many years uh, hyper mediatized, hyper commentized uh, uh, struggle. Everybody in the world know that Israel continue day by day to violate international law. So companies cannot afford to say we didn't know. They know, they should know, and they have to know since the beginning of the first execution of any contract passed in Israel. Fourth, fourth observation, France has been at the origin uh, in Europe, has been the first country in Europe to integrate in his criminal code an article 121-2, uh, which states that legal persons, with the exception of the state, are criminally liable for the offenses committed on their account by their organs or representatives according to the distinction set out in the article 121-4 and 121-7. The criminal liability of legal persons does not exclude that of any natural person who are perpetrators or accomplices to the same act subject to the provision of the fourth paragraph of the article 121-3. So this is new and France has been in advance with other countries in the recognition of the criminal, criminal liability of companies. So quickly, let's, uh, let's see under what condition French company uh, may be prosecuted uh, before a French judge. The civil avenue is not a very relevant avenue for the victims. It's not a very relevant avenue under French law for the, for the quick following reasons. One, we don't have in our civil code any provision which looks like class action. It has been refused by lawmakers. It has been refused by companies. We do not have also kind of provision uh, look, which look like to disclosure which exists under English law or US law. So this uh, creates a main burden uh, for the victim to bring pieces of evidence of the misconduct before the civil judge. So the civil avenue is not, for the victim, uh, a very relevant and efficient avenue. So let's come back uh, quickly on, on what could be the base of a criminal action uh, faced, with the, faced with the French judge. The Article 121-6 of the Criminal Code said, the accomplice to the offence in the meaning of the Article 121-7 is punishable as a perpetrator. And the Article 121-7 states, the accomplice to a felony or a misdemeanor is a person who knowingly, by aiding and abetting, facilitates its preparation or commission. Any person who by means or gift, promise, threat, order, or an abuse of authority or powers provokes the commission of an offense or give instructions to commit it is also an accomplice. So what consequences of this 
may be uh, drawn uh, now. We may say at that step that the different positive acts that can be acts of complicity are the following. First, provocation and instruction. Provocation and instruction are not relevant for companies. <coughs> companies never gave instruction to commit a crime. Companies never provoke a crime. So let's come back to more relevant act of complicity. The fact of aiding and abetting must occur before the perpetration. The help can be provided during the preparation of the offense or during its execution. This is the first relevant base for prosecuting French companies. There is also a second juridical base, which is the following, supply of means. What is supply of means? It can be first, it can be the supply of material means used to commit the offense, weapons, documents, or any means useful. The means must, of course, have been supplied while knowing that it was going to be used to commit an offense. Let's come back to this. We cannot say, it would be ridiculous to say that all arms or weapons manufacturers are complice of war crimes. Otherwise, all of them would, could be prosecuted. So you have to add a specific, uh, a specific uh, demonstration. What is a specific demonstration? You are a French company which supply arms or ammunition to Tsar, to Israeli army. You cannot afford to say we didn't know that it would not be used for committing war crimes because historically war crimes are committed day by day before all the eyes of international community by Israeli forces. So the fact that you have necessarily the knowing, it's no more a probability, it's no more an hypothesis, it's a certainty that the arms you are going to supply will be used to commit war crimes. It's not a possibility. It's not likely. It's a certainty, and this has to be taken in account by your tribunal. And of course, uh, you, you, your tribunal know that uh, criminal French code does not admit complicity by abstention, complicity by silence, complicity by neutrality. This cannot be considered as a relevant base for complicity. But let's convince, let's try to convince the tribunal uh, of perhaps uh, another legal avenue. What is, uh, in, in my understanding, uh, for the next future, a real relevant uh, legal avenue. Your tribunal, I invite your tribunal to bring together not only uh, formally uh, the criminal code, because I've sufficiently uh, stressed the fact that it was not so easy to demonstrate the existence of the moral element. And you have all of you have understood that the moral element is not only the awareness, but the willing, the intention. But what should convince you to shift from the awareness to the willing or to the intention is one. The fact that the violation of international law is unanimously, more or less unanimously accepted. The fact that repeatedly, daily and daily, war crimes are committed uh, in Israel. This is one. Second, the fact that the same companies, which could be considered as complice, multiply commit commitments uh, in favor of sustainable development and human rights. And this creates new obligation. You cannot say if you are a company, I commit myself in favor of human rights and refuse that this commitment may be considered as a reinforcement of your liability and of your responsibility. And three, I invite your tribunal to consider that the development of uh, this recommendation of the special rapporteur for responsibility 
of transnational. All the works done by United Nations, the fact that all these companies uh, are more or less linked to global compacts, is the beginning of the creation of a customary international law applicable to transnationals. This is new. This is before our eyes that there is this new emergence of a customary international law applicable to the companies. So I do consider that uh, more and more, because of the companies themselves, we will have base to prosecute them before a French judge. I thank the tribunal for his attention. Thank you very much, William. Mr. Chairman, yeah. as uh, the um, panel co-chair, I would like to take the opportunity to pose my questions at this point. Um, of uh, all three of our witnesses, I have a series of questions, but in deference to the others who may have questions, I will limit to uh, just one right now. And that question is, you've talked about the laws, the state laws, and the international uh, legal framework within which we are considering this subject matter today. My question is, is the legal framework sufficient for um, our uh, mission in trying to find ways in which we can hold corporations accountable? Or do we need additional law? And if we need additional law, in what venue do we need it? Well, this is a very, uh, very burning issue, very burning, very crucial question. Uh, so I've tried to, to, to demonstrate that uh, at the stage we are, uh, the, the, the French law, uh, if, you, if you mix together, if you bring together the French law with the commitments of the company, if you, if you uh, watch the website of Veolia, if you watch the website of the bank uh, which invests all over the world and also in West Bank, you, you will see that the company commits himself in favor of human rights. This did not exist 10 years ago. This is absolutely new. And they cannot afford to say we, we commit ourselves in human rights, but we don't want that anyone, all consequences of these commitments. So in my opinion, as jurist, and I've tried already to plead this, and I want to give you an example, uh, I plead before the Tribunal and the Court of Appeal for various NGO in the Erika case. Erika case uh, was this uh, absolutely tremendous, awful uh, pollution caused by the wreckage of a boat called Erika. And I've said to the court, uh, ten years ago, Total committed himself in favor of sustainable development. So it means that that this personal commitment of Total has created an obligation of vigilance, of cautiousness, which doesn't come from the law, but come from this commitment. So, of course, uh, idealistically, idealistically, uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to, 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 to be at the origin of an international uh, compelling system applicable for the, for the transnational. It's too early to say if it will be possible. This framework for the moment does not exist. But the combination of the national law, of the emergence of the customary international law, and the commitments of the company are sufficient, in my assessment, to prosecute them. Thank you very much. Can I just uh, pick up on, uh, I've just been provided th uh, with a response uh, that Veolia have sent to the Russell Tribunal on the very point you've just uh, mentioned. I'm not going to read it all, but this is what they do say. In their letter, this is what they're saying. Yeah. Yeah. This is the 8th of November, yeah. 2010. At all times, we've sought to obey international law, and we have stated that if it were ruled by a proper, properly constituted judicial court that we were in breach of international law, then we would withdraw. We therefore did not oppose the decision by the French courts that they had jurisdiction, and we always made it plain that we would abide by their decision. 
Yeah, a comment on this, on this paragraph. Uh, uh, I'm not so sure that the earlier would not have succeed. It's possible that plenty of uh, who have size French tribunal uh, may see at the end their request rejected. But what is new uh, is the fact that one of the consequences of this ethical uh, commitment of companies has created an opinion tribunal, a worldwide civil society tribunal, court. And the reactivity of the company when they enter in a controversial matter make for them to renounce to their investment before any judgment, even if they have juridically the possibility to win, they prefer to renounce than to lose before the opinion tribunal. Thank you. I think I'm just looking because we're dealing with time here. I'm sorry about this. Is there, is there time? Sorry for one more question. Or we, one, 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 question. Okay, John, one question. Yes, I, I would like, like to ask uh, Yasmin a uh, question. Uh, Yasmin, uh, referring to the doctrine of forum non convenience again, uh, you say that uh, one could uh, argue in a U.S. court that uh, a U.S. court was more appropriate because, I quote you, Israeli courts are biased. Now, let, let's be realistic. If one looks at the jurisprudence of uh, the United States, particularly in a case such as the uh, recent Dichter decision, isn't it very clear to say that U.S. courts are, to put it kindly, highly sympathetic to uh, the Israeli government, the Israeli position? And at the same time, I think it's clear from what you have said in relation to recent interpretations of the Alien Tort Act that there is an hostility towards uh, claims against corporations. So if you add these two together, First of all, the attempts on the part of the courts to protect corporations from the Alien Tort Act. And secondly, these decisions which do show a certain degree of sympathy for the Israeli position. Isn't it unlikely that one is going to get a sympathetic hearing before a U.S. court? Yeah, I, I agree. <clears throat> and um, I just do want to point out, though, uh, that this when you mentioned hostility to, to cases against corporations under the Alien Tort Claims Act, um, I think, and maybe Maria can, I don't know, back me up, that um, that was kind of a surprise decision. Um, it, you know, this was uh, a principle that had been assumed, um, you know, in the Alien Tort Claims Act cases against corporations. So, it, it, you know, it's not a uniform hostility, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, that's one thing. But yes, I agree. Um, there is bias in the U.S. in the U.S. courts against cases by Palestinians. In fact, I think every case that has been brought against an Israeli defendant has been unsuccessful. Um, I have a question for Yasmin as well. I understand we have a time constraint, but this directly um, stems from her uh, testimony. And uh, there is a move across the United States to repeal corporate personhood. And Pittsburgh just recently did that. Would that make it easier, the repeal of corporate personhood? Does that make it easier to uh, hold uh, corporations accountable? Um. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure, <laughs> to be honest. Well, on that, on that happy note, <laughs> um, may we just enjoy, I'm very sorry to have to try and keep a grip on time a little bit, um, but we're going to take a break now for 20 minutes. So if you could be back in 20 minutes time for the next session that you have in your folders. Thank you very much indeed. National, and là, la notion de complicité y est précisée davantage et l'obligation d'éviter de se rendre complice de violation des droits de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire y est précisé dans les termes suivants. Bon, ces micros, ils sont pas pratiques, hein. Les sociétés transnationales et autres entreprises ne participent pas à des crimes de guerre, crimes contre l'humanité, génocide, actes de torture, disparition forcée, pratiques de travail forcé ou obligatoire, prise d'otage, exécution extrajudiciaire, sommaire ou arbitraire, autres violations du droit international humanitaire et autres crimes internationaux contre la personne telle que définie 
par le droit international. Ici aussi, le tribunal Russell aura statué sur des cas, et notamment le cas de la société Violia, directement impliquée dans la construction d'une ligne de tramway reliant euh, Jérusalem aux colonies de peuplement dans les territoires palestiniens, sachant aussi ici que cette pratique est interdite par la quatrième convention de Genève. Et là aussi, je vous cite l'article. La puissance occupante ne pourra pas procéder à la déportation ou au transfert d'une partie de sa propre population civile dans un territoire occupé par elle. Alors, la, la volonté d'approfondir la notion de complicité euh, amènera le secrétaire général des Nations Unies en 2005 à nommer un représentant spécial chargé de la question des entreprises multinationales et du respect international des droits de l'homme en la personne de John Ruggi, professeur à l'université d'Adward. Il soumettra un rapport très important en 2008 qui renvoie euh, à la notion de diligence raisonnable. La notion de diligence raisonnable oblige toute entreprise à évaluer les risques potentiels de participation à des violations des droits de l'homme dans leur activité quotidienne et le cas échéant à y mettre fin. Là aussi, le tribunal recèle sur la Palestine aura statué sur des cas tels que le cas de la banque d'Exia et d'analyser si, par exemple, le groupe bancaire belge ne méconnaît pas son obligation de diligence raisonnable en participant à l'effort de colonisation des territoires palestiniens. Alors, fonder la responsabilité des entreprises en droit international n'est pas toujours évident. Néanmoins... Voilà, je disais donc que la question de la complicité des entreprises multinationales avait fait débat ces dernières années au sein des Nations Unies. Et c'est ce qui avait amené le, à l'initiative du secrétaire général, les Nations Unies, à adopter un pacte mondial qui s'adressait directement aux entreprises et où la, la question de la complicité y était abordée de manière directe. En effet, ce pacte stipule, et je le cite, les entreprises sont invitées à veiller à ce que leurs propres compagnies ne se rendent pas complices des violations des droits de l'homme. Alors si ce texte n'est pas contraignant, il permet néanmoins d'établir une typologie claire des différents types de complicité. Et à ce titre, je vais encore vous le citer, il prévoit que il y a complicité directe quand une entreprise aide sciemment un État à violer les droits de l'homme. Il y a complicité avec profit quand une entreprise tire directement avantage des violations des droits de l'homme commises par autrui. Enfin, il y a complicité silencieuse selon les défenseurs des droits de l'homme quand une entreprise s'abstient de soulever la question des violations systématiques ou persistantes des droits de l'homme dans ses relations avec les autorités politiques. À, ce, à, à, à cet égard, le tribunal Russell sur la Palestine aura par exemple à statuer sur le cas d'entreprises à l'instar de Caterpillar qui fournissent euh, des bulldozers destinés à la destruction des maisons dans les territoires palestiniens, sachant que les destructions de maisons sont formellement interdites par la quatrième convention de Genève. Et là, je vous cite aussi l'article qui les a interdits pour donner corps à mon propos. Il est interdit à la puissance... Je baisse un peu les micros, voilà. Il est interdit à la puissance occupante de détruire des biens immobiliers ou immobiliers appartenant individuellement ou collectivement à des personnes privées, à l'État ou à des collectivités publiques, à des organisations sociales ou coopératives, sauf dans les cas où ces destructions seraient rendues absolument nécessaires par les opérations militaires. Un pas, sera import, un pas important sera franchi au sein des Nations Unies en 2003 avec l'adoption d'un texte sur les normes Portant sur le respect des droits de l'homme par les entreprises multinationales. corporations, But it's an area in which I've worked, and I hope to be able to give um, some assistance to the tribunal <clears throat> in trying to come to terms with what the framework is for understanding where and when, excuse me, <clears throat> the law can provide 
mechanisms for accountability and redress. And I'm going to talk particularly about English law, because it's the only area of law I know anything uh, about. But it does need to be seen in the context with the... Uh, uh, um, that'd be perfect, thank you very much. With the evidence that you're also going to hear um, from my colleagues from France and America, because there's a big picture here. And that big picture stems uh, from this. It, is a frustration that was felt by many in the human rights field as to the inadequacy of the systems for redress for victims of human rights violations. Since the Second World War, law has been very good at putting in place mechanisms for dealing with violations of human rights abuses by states. We have the, the great conventions, the great international conventions, protecting the rights of individuals, but that's all about states. And it's all about states' action against states, and it's all about individual react individuals' interaction with states. From the human rights context, the world is a more complicated place. Because whilst it is undoubtedly true that states continue to infringe human rights violations, uh, and indeed that is why uh, we are here, the way that multinational corporations have been shown to operate demonstrates, firstly, that they too uh, have been complicit in, in human rights abuses, and it secondly identifies the absence of... So now... Uh, we will start, and the first thing that I must ask you, do you have the earphone? Because some people will speak in French. If you don't have, uh, uh, there is translation between French and uh, English. I hope that you have your uh, earphone. If not, maybe you can ask one, and uh, we can give it to you. Uh, and we will start with the first session the legal framework relevant to corporate, co to corporate conduct. And uh, we have uh, one, two, three, four intervention of experts. I will thank at this occasion all the experts having do all the preparation of this session, all the work that they have done, and uh, also to the witnesses to be here today and to help us to go to the conclusion of this uh, international session of the Russell Terminal on Palestine. I will ask to uh, Osin Wasa to come to the floor and to give his contribution. He will speak in French. La question de la complicité euh, des entreprises multinationales dans la violation des droits internationaux, du droit de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire est soulevée par différents ordres juridiques internationaux, tels que nous aurons l'occasion de le voir dans quelques instants. Le droit international n'est pas en reste sur cette question. La nécessité d'encadrer juridiquement les agissements des, act des, des entreprises multinationales et partant leur éventuelle complicité dans les violations du droit international, des droits de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire, a fait débat ces dernières années aux Nations Unies. C'est ainsi qu'en 1999, à l'initiative du secrétaire général des Nations Unies, le rapporteur spécial des Nations Unies préconise de procéder à un raisonnement par analogie avec les principes du droit international pénal international et pour ce faire, il s'appuie sur la jurisprudence. Merci Pierre. Je disais donc que fonder la responsabilité des entreprises en droit international n'est pas chose évidente. Et pour ce faire, le rapporteur spécial des Nations Unies préconise 
de procéder à un raisonnement par analogie avec les principes du droit international, euh, le principe du droit pénal international. Pour ce faire, il s'appuie sur la jurisprudence des tribunaux pénaux internationaux pour l'ex-Yougoslavie et le Rwanda, et notamment aussi sur la jurisprudence de la Cour pénale internationale. Bien que ces, euh, ces, ces trois institutions judiciaires euh, ne concernent dans leurs compétences que les personnes physiques, l'analyse de leur jurisprudence permet d'aller au-delà de ces considérations et d'établir obligation, une obligation internationale de ne pas prêter assistance aux violations des droits de l'homme et du droit international humanitaire. Je vous remercie. Merci à Ousra. Et je passe maintenant la parole à Richard Hermer. Richard Hermer. Yes, welcome. You have the floor. Richard Hammer is from the UK. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, members of the uh, tribunal, my name is uh, Richard Hermer. I'm a lawyer practicing in London. I was called to the bar in 1993 and appointed Queen's Counsel in 2009. The uh, <clears throat> area in which I practice is human rights, and it falls into mainly two areas. Firstly, uh, it is uh, seeking redress for victims of government violations of human rights. So, for example, uh, I've represented people who've been tortured by the British Army in Iraq, or more recently, um, those um, who uh, were held British citizens.